Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Ashu. Today, another special session with none other than Dr. Rob Orman about our careers. He's such an amazing font of knowledge, and I really hope you benefit from the discussion. Before we dive into it, I want to remind you about ebmedicine.net, your one-stop shop for all things emergency medicine, pediatric emergency medicine, and urgent care. Don't forget all of the courses we have available to you, the laceration course, the new abscess course, the urgent care coding courses, the EKG course, such a font of resources available for you at your fingertips, on your mobile device, in the mobile app, at ebmedicine.net. I could go on and on and on. Just go there, get your CME, get your education, and let us help you with your career. And now, let's dive into that conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. And today we are joined by, once again, the world famous Dr. Rob Orman, MD, kind enough to grace us with his presence at my special invitation to talk about things that have to do with our career. Rob, welcome. Sam, always a treat to get to chat with you, my friend. I'm excited about today's talk because I would say there's few things I like talking about more than ways to stay interested in your career and yeah. ways to keep your career going, your career longevity. And we've talked about that before. And I noticed recently as I was reflecting on my own career, I was telling somebody the story of where I am today and what I do and how I got here. And I noticed this pattern of frequent changes in my life. You know, there was the undergraduate period of my life, which was about four years. And there was the med school period of my life, which was about four years. And there was the residency part of my life, which was three years. Then there was this kind of new attending period of my life where I didn't focus on anything except emergency medicine and kind of getting my feet anchored in something solid. And that was about four or five years. And then I went into this administrative kick for a while and started doing more administrative work, became a medical director and did some other things. And that was a duration of about five years. And then I went on to something else. And it just seemed like this ongoing cycle of four or five years. And then there's another change in my life, which brought me kind of full circle around to where I am today. And I thought, gosh, I wonder if this is just purely coincidence or if there is a rhythm to life that I hadn't noticed before. And maybe this is a healthy thing. And I thought, who better to have this discussion with than Rob Orman about whether or not there is a cycle to this kind of thing or if there should be, you know, is it a good thing? And maybe not wait until life changes, but maybe you can get proactive about it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So my questions for you are things like, first, have you noticed any kind of similar cycle in your life? Oh, yeah, definitely. Have also had many trades within my career. I want to back up though. You've had so many things in there that I think that could and may in fact make the entire podcast. When you're talking about change in career, I want to make sure I address the question you just asked, but what's popping up for me and it's like, okay, are there changes after all of those things that you do, you know, undergrad, med school, residency, new attending? I think the answer to that is there's always changes. And Maybe not everyone is viewing it like that, but I think in a healthy career, there's always changes because a career is a process. You know, we think it's one thing, you know, you go through all this stuff and then you get plopped into attending hood. Plop, okay, here I am. Plopped. Here I am. I'm done. And one of the challenges in medicine, I'm curious how this will land with you, especially the challenge of being a physician, is that you get on this path, you make that big decision that I want to go for med school. And that's a really conscious decision because it's a big sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But once you make that decision, the road is really laid out for you. So you're just kind of skipping across these stones and you wind up in this place. Okay, now I'm an attending. And until that point, when you get out there and you're on your own, there's really not an external force pushing on you to do some self-inquiry mm -hmm. to say, what am I doing why am I doing? Who, who am I? Why did I make this decision? Because you are on autopilot. I mean, you have to do the work, but it's just laid out for you, which is why, you know, talk to a lot of pre-meds these days and say, yeah, I really like this because I don't have to think what business am I going to start up? You know, even being a, a lawyer, which is almost pre-programmed, that isn't quite as clear cut, but being a doctor is. Mm -hmm. And you take that first job as an attending and much like you made that decision 
about the field that you're going to go into. For you and I, it was emergency medicine. And I feel like almost everybody makes that decision with insufficient information. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <laughs> you have no idea what it's going to be like to do that job for real. Mm -hmm. And you have no idea how it's going to align with your propensities, your proclivities, your strengths, your weaknesses, where you'll shine, where you'll feel deflated. So a short answer to that is, are there career changes when you become an attending or are there changes or are there developmental stages? Who was that? Kubler-Ross? Who were the developmental right. stages? Yeah. Oh, wow. wow. Pulling it back from you, school. Man. <laughs> I don't know if I've talked about this on, on Amplify before, but that first year out, or even the first two, but at least that first year out, I think of as your fellowship. And you know, I'll work with young docs and they'll say, yeah, my leadership is saying that I'm slower than the other docs. Of course you are. You're still learning how to be a doctor. That's your fellowship and doctoring. And then after that, you start developing pathways of how you're going to manage certain presentations and building your bandwidth. And then you start thinking, is this job a good fit? Is this a good fit for me? And then, well, what does that mean? And then that question then builds in, do I want to shift what my career looks like? Mm -hmm. So to your question of, are there cycles of changes? Is that a natural thing? I think it is. And I do know that not everybody pays attention to that internal cyclical nature of, yeah, who I am now is different than who I was five years ago. Yeah. My level of energy, what I'm interested in, what my family is doing, just who I am. I'm going to say hard yes. Awesome. And then in your personal life, did you see a similar time frame in those cycles or did they happen just kind of sporadically? There was a, a change here and a change there and there's really no rhyme or reason to how much time passed between. Let's talk about trades. We had a guest on Stimulus recently who does career coaching and he has this great frame of it talking about trades, trading in one career for another. And I was thinking about that a lot. And when you think about trading a career, it kind of conjures up this complete makeover. To short answer your question, I'm about it every two year. Two years, okay. Two year trade, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even within coaching, how I do it, I have made trades. We can talk about what those have looked like, but yeah, there's just this continual reassessment. But when we think about trading in a career, it's almost like an image of take this job and shove it. <laughs> so, I, I'm a doctor, I'm going to become a teacher. I'm a right. banker, I'm going to become a bow catcher, whatever. And with medicine, that is a big ask, that big trade, because mm. you know the sunk costs are just extraordinary. And you want to give it a shot. So I like to break down the trades, at least in my own mind, into different levels. Because sometimes there's only a tiny adjustment that's needed. So I think of micro, macro, and tectonic. Mm -hmm. Trades. So a micro trade, that's a small trade within a current career that shifts experience from feeling this unsatisfactoriness towards more satisfactoriness. And that could be as much as like you were talking about before, oh, I'm going to start teaching the med students and the residents and the PA students and really add education in, or I'm going to start focusing on my processes and how I document and working on my efficiencies and my effectiveness. Those are micro traits. Or I'm going to take a leadership role, or I'm going to do something else within the constraints of pretty much what I'm doing. That's a micro. Then there's a macro trade. In the macro trade, you still have the same career, still doctor, still clinician. Whereas a micro trade, people on the outside might not be able to tell you made it. Yeah. With a macro trade, people can definitely tell you made it. So that would be, I'm going to change the ED where I work. I'm going to change the type of work that I do. You know, maybe I'll start doing more telemedicine and start building that in. Maybe I'll change my title. Macro trading might involve moving to another facility. It might involve salary adjustments, and it might even involve less of a salary than you're making. We can talk about how to assess if it's time for this. Then there is the tectonic trade. And you and I have both made some tectonic trades in the past. And that is the big kahuna. That is calling it a day on the current job and starting an entirely new career. Personally, you were asking the trades I've made. I've had dozens of micro trades. I've had a handful of macro trades. And I have had three tectonic trades wow. in my career. Complete changes of job description. 
I will say this, that a trade is a trade only if you initiate it. If you trade for any other reason other than improving your experience, it's not a like capital trade in all caps. It's just a lowercase trade. <laughs> you were traded were from the <laughs> Yankees to the Red Sox. Not, okay, I'm going to make my trade. Yeah. Uh, but I will pause there. I mean, this is an, an endless field, fertile field of conversation. But yes, I have made those trades, the micro trades quite frequently, the macro trades every five, six to 10 years, and then the tectonic trades on a larger timescale, just like tectonic shifts. Yeah. And do you think that those trades came to you out of necessity or were they more intentional? I mean, did you sit and take an assessment and go, you know what? I'm not happy where I am right now. It's time to make some change. What are my options? Were they intentional at every step or even at some of those steps? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to know how you should do it or want to know how it actually happened for <laughs> yeah. me? But I don't know. Which or one do you want to know? Both. I want to know both. So f for me, the majority of the trades at the beginning of my career were forced of, this is not working. This is not sustainable. I want to be doing something else. I want to be someone else. I'm going to not last in this career. And so it was getting to that. It, there was no prophylaxis. I think that's what you're talking about. You're talking about yeah. prophylaxis versus treatment. There was no prophylaxis. And getting up probably about 18, maybe 17 years in, then I really started prophylaxing. And it wasn't so much of feeling that burn, feeling that this isn't where I want to be. It was, let me just look into the future or let me just assess what's happening now and how do I make this shift. And that's really hard because inertia is so powerful. Hey, this is fine. Why do I want to shake up the boat? Why do I want to make any of these changes? I've got, I got insurance. I got this, I got that. So it does take some activation energy to yeah, make yeah, that happen. Does. So I think that the point you're getting into is, is it ideal to wait until you're pushed into that decision or should you have a process wherein you reflect on what's going on? Am I reading that right? Yes. Yeah, for sure. I think in, you know, looking at my career in the ED, which allowed me to intersect with many, many physicians in all walks of life new ones and well-established ones and ones close to retirement, you know, we see the specialists come down and you can see it on their face, the spectrum of where they are in their life. And I got a chance to see lots of people who were tremendously unhappy in their career, who would come down into the ED and it would just manifest in some other form. You know, either patient care was terrible, their interaction with the staff was terrible. They come to work late. They would do everything they could to get out as early as they could. They were never really supportive of their partners that we could tell from looking on the outside. And so it made me start to wonder, perhaps it would be better if we approached it with more of a, hey, you don't just become an attending and then go off in the green pastures 40 years later and, and now you're done. This is not where you end. This is just the beginning of some new pathway. But expect that you need to have with some regularity a, a sit down and check in and uh, an evaluation and, and what's that time frame? I don't know any of those answers. Uh, you know, what, so when we're talking about time frame, I, I have not found evidence that there's some ideal time frame. I have heard some folks recommend every six months, which seems a lot. Wow. You know, you're basically doing a performance review on your own job, and that can start to feel like you've just finished one and you're starting the next one once a year, just as a rough estimate. I think is great. And a way to do that, there's myriad ways, there's, and there's not one right way, but a way that I learned early on and started using and now use with clients is you write down and you've got to write it. You can't just think it. You got to take it from pen. There is something special about pen to paper and you can type it out, but I, I personally like to write it. There's just something different about that. I don't know if it's a, some different neural pathway. But you write down your ideal job description or your perfect job or your genie job. Genie came out of a lamp. Boom, let me just create your ideal job. Put down all of the aspects of it. Pay, pace, culture, location, leadership, the EMR. How do you feel? Do you feel that you're pressured or do you feel kind of calm? Do you feel a little bored or do you feel it's always on the edge of collapse? I don't know. It just depends on the person. And you just get as granular as possible. Now, it's funny that some of the things that you will write down are almost certainly going to be reactive to the stuff that you dislike in your current place. Yes. 
So you take that and you, you write that down and that exercise alone starts the process of what is it that I'm looking for? And then you think about what is my current job? Let me just get a gestalt of this. And how much overlap do I have between my current job and my ideal job? You look at that and like, what's the percentage? And what are things that I can do to start to increase that overlap? What are things that are within my control that I can do? Now, some of those things are internal. Some of those things are, I can work on my own processes. I can work on my mindset. I can work on my communication. You know, oftentimes the docs who are in places that have a lot of patients with vague neurologic complaints get frustrated with that. Maybe I can develop my own pathways for that and how I'm going to approach those and just have efficiencies and effectiveness. And then it might be, well, I'm going to work on the system that, oh, that this process is really bumming me out and slowing me down. I'm going to see if I can shift that, or this is morally injurious to me. I want to work on that within the system to help these patients and help the clinicians and make more concordance, more Venn diagram overlap between my current job and my ideal job. And so that's within career. That's making micro and possibly macro change changes. You know, the tectonic changes is I got nothing to write down because that career coach I was talking to, had a great phrase. He said, I've gotten all I have to get from this job mm. and I have given all I have to give. And I am just, I am reliving another yesterday and every day is reliving these yesterdays and I don't want to be doing that and I'm ready to go. So those are kind of different things, you know, and what and we're that's talking the, about. Uh, like the flip the page in the book scenario where you're like, okay, yeah. I ended this piece of paper. Now I'm flipping the page. We're starting over with something else. Yeah. And that feeling within medicine is really unique because it's not necessarily that you have to flip the page. That's when you get to red alert. I am burnt. You get the emotional exhaustion, the depersonalization, the reduced personal accomplishment, all of these things. And whew, I am burnt. I have had enough. All right. But my job is to say, all right, here's where I am. Here's where I want to be. How do we bridge that gap? And then people just feel stuck on bridging that gap because there's no training in that. There's yeah. no training on it. I mean, we're talking about it right now. We're yeah. talking about how to do these things, why we have this podcast. But it's really hard. It's hard to know. What are my steps? What's the first move in this thing? Is it time to, as they'd say in the military, pop smoke, drop the mic? That's right. <laughs> Or make a micro trade. Actually, I can't even remember what the original question was. It just started kind of Honestly, go, like, going off on there. You did. You did answer it. It was a discussion about how often one should make that kind of personal assessment. And you suggested maybe once a year is a good time to just sit and reflect at least and maybe make that list and start that process of a little introspection about where you are and where you want to be. When you work with physicians, do you find that it is important to distinguish between I'm reflecting on my career and where I want to be, or I'm mostly irritated and feeling almost frustrated and, and close to burning out with my current conditions. Is it helpful to distinguish between those things? Is it just the conditions of your career? Is it the conditions of your practice? Or is it your satisfaction with your career? Which of the two is the problem so that we can kind of tailor the medical therapy for your, yeah, for your condition? That's a great question. And of course, that's going to be so individualized, but it's the conversation of what's going on. Where are you right now? What's going on? Where's the unsatisfactoriness? I usually do have clients come and everything is satisfactory and they just want to make sure that they are prophylaxing their career. That's maybe one in 20 mm. comes that way. And I think, wow. All right. Good for you. But often, that, that's, I, it's amazing. And we end up working together for years because they just want to continue that prophylaxis and the maintenance. But oftentimes there is that sense of this is not working out in some way. And sometimes it's on a small level. Sometimes it's a big level. And there's a lot of questions to tease that out. If you just taking a, a big stroke, where are you now? Where are you now in your life and your career? Because I mean, career is part of life. But if we think of inside the hospital and outside the hospital, where are you in that? And what would you like that to look like in six months? What would you like that to look like in a year or three years? What would that perfect shift look like? What would that perfect day look like? And sometimes there's no answer because I just feel stuck. I don't even yeah. know anymore. I, I can't even say where I'd want to be because I just worked, 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 worked to get here. And then what do I do now? Yeah. 
So then that's the place to start. Sometimes, oftentimes, that involves working with what you have at the moment. And that's a good place to start. Not that that's the answer. And those things might not even be applied to what we actually end up doing. But just start thinking about what is it in your current situation that you can change? And so often there is something in leadership which is not ideal. Oh, my director or my boss is just not the best and they're not an effective leader. They were you probably a year ago or, or whatever. And so I think that's just not fixable. And a lot of people do leave their current position because of poor leadership, but mm. there's actually ways to work on that. And that, we'll just use that as a small example. So you've got somebody and you think, oh my gosh, they just say these things, they do these edicts and there's no communication and they just, we're just not aligned. And but you know what? That person's under stress too. And so how about you manage up? You always think like you're being managed down to. I didn't think we were going to get something like this, but this is a real tactical move here. It's like you have this leadership, it's not effective. Okay. Meet with them and you think, first off, what do I want my relationship with that leader to be like? What are the things that I can do to foster that? And then meet with them and ask them, how do they define success in their job? What mm -hmm. is it that they see their role as? What is it that they are not getting? And how can you then be basically an instrument for them to achieve that? And how can you then get aligned with leadership? Now, sometimes you just have completely ineffective and incompetent leadership, but oftentimes it's just, you're not seeing what they're seeing mm -hmm. and their stresses and what their leaders are saying that they need to be doing. And so when you can make a connection like that, it totally changes things. And I've had docs go from saying, oh, my leaders are just idiots to, oh, I am now a part of leadership and I get it and I see it and now I've bridged that gap. So that's just a small thing. And there's a micro trade within a career and someone saying, this is just not working that, well, it seems like there's nothing you can do, but there's actually a lot of things you can do. And so you work on where you are at first. And then see, all right, let me look around if it's not coming to that. Look around at other places. Or do I need to be looking at other careers? They, half of docs come to me and say, I want out of emergency medicine. All right, let's just slow that down a little bit and tease it apart. Yeah. And sometimes we get them out. Mm. Most of the time, we just shift what that job looks like because it turns out that most docs love medicine. It's just all the other crap around it that is not fun. There's just so much negativity and there's just so much no, and there's so much you're not enough. And there's so much you should be doing that. All right. That's a lot to take. Let's start shifting some things around and yeah. see if we can keep you in the game, which it sounds like you want to stay in the game. Yeah. I think for me early on, it was the necessity, you know, as you mentioned, you're focusing on things that were inadequate in my practice or in my skill set, and then trying to refine those and improve those. And then as time went on, it became inadequacies in the practice in general, not in my mm -hmm. personal practice, but it yeah. was kind of extending that bubble outward to the group could be doing this a little bit better. And some of that was out of necessity and changes in reimbursement and rules and stuff like that. And then the scope became bigger. It went from just being me to then the emergency department and then the hospital. And then it became, you know, beyond. There are other ERs and other places. And then ultimately... I noticed that with each step, it brought like a little more interest, a little bit more joy into the practice of what mm. I was doing. It was like, oh, it's something fresh and new and I get to learn something new. And it was almost like the joy that came from each step was in becoming a learner again and trying to wrap my head around some new circumstance or some new condition. And I think that is what ultimately provided me with the relief I needed is each one of these steps just brought me back to that. I really like to learn new things and it's fun to do. And it's fun to do within the confines of still being a physician. I didn't really lose that identity with any of those steps. Yeah. You are tapping into something that I think is so key that almost none of us reflect on. And you and I were talking about this beforehand. That's purpose. Why am I here? Why am I on this earth? And purpose is something that doesn't really change that much in your adult life. The mission and how it's executed and how you make that purpose into action and reality and incorporate it in your life, that changes because mm -hmm. what you're doing changes. And I'm listening to you say that, 
And it's that learning and edu- I mean, I've known you for a long time. It's that learning and it's educating. And if I could articulate your purpose, and I know how you interact with your family, and it sounds like I serve by learning and sharing that knowledge or I serve and so- something like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And when you tap into that, I don't know about what you call it. You get some funny thing, you know, the on purpose person. Actually, oh, you know what? There's a book called that, you know, trademark 1992, working on purpose or being on purpose. It sounds so cliche or hackneyed or trite, but it's a really a thing. And there's this, I think it's called the on purpose person. And the guy who wrote it uses the metaphor of a light switch that when you are on purpose, like a light switch goes off. Or when you actually turn on any switch, you ask yourself, am I acting on purpose? Am I aligned with that? And if I'm not, how do I need to course correct? This is shifting gears a little bit, but just when you're talking about that, I said, yeah, that's what you were aligning with. And so many people get to mid-career and think, all right, I'm pretty much doing this for the paycheck. <laughs> yeah. And in a job like emergency medicine, which my first experience with the emergency department was in... 1994, 93, when I was a med student. So from there to now we're 2024, I have not seen the practice get easier. I mean, there is nothing about It's so true. Yeah. yeah the only thing, well, maybe the, that there's PACS systems and you don't have to have x-rays tubed back and forth through radiology. Maybe that, that did get easier. Some things did, but the overall process and the admin of this experience has not gotten easier. And so when you do it just for the paycheck, that's really hard. There, there is a purpose there. You know, I exist to serve my family by caring for them and supporting them. Well, okay, there's a purpose. It's fine. I mean, whatever it is. But when it's just the paycheck, so hard to sustain because that's not a fuel tank that self-refills. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you should say that, actually, because I think the biggest change that came in my career did not come as a result of wanting to learn more or teach more or some new experience it actually came because i could not see my family uh-huh. in the quantity that i wanted to so i went a week or a week and a half without even seeing my children just because of the way that my shifts were organized uh, and they were in school and i would always go in right before they got out of school and then i would get out when they were already asleep in bed and then i would be asleep when they left for school the next morning and i went like a week and a half didn't even see my kids And that was the straw that broke the camel's back figuratively. It was not any of the other things, none of the new projects or endeavors or anything else. And core emergency medicine and seeing patients in the emergency department was still the core part of my practice up until that point. And then I was like, you know what? This is the not sustainable part of the career that needs a change. That was the driver for the biggest change, interestingly. Oh, have you ever read the book Designing Your Life? Mm-hmm. As you're talking about that, I'm thinking about this dashboard. And so I, I love this exercise. These guys were or are engineers, and I don't know, mechanical or computer. And so everything is kind of broken down. It's like, oh, let's just make a dashboard and see how it's going. First off, what's my core focus? And for a lot of us, it's our family. Yeah. You know, like that's what's going to come first. That's what we put the fences and the boundaries around. And when we feel oh, there's some unsatisfactoriness, it's when those boundaries don't stay firm. And we just kind of get creeping into that. But these guys said, all right, let's just figure out what does a life dashboard look like? And they broke it down into four categories of work, love, play, and health. And those are always in flux. You know, sometimes if five of your partners are on sick leave, okay, you're working a lot of shifts. Some groups have trouble getting new staff, and then it turns out you're working 20 shifts a month for years. And Mm -hmm. it sounds like the work is off the charts. And when you look at that, okay, how's it all going? If you you put it on a gauge of too much, not enough, or just right. I mean, it's hard to have too much love, but love is the love you give, the love you receive. And as you're talking about that, it sounds like the work dial was getting way too much and the love dial was getting way too little. Oh, that is out of balance. And the same thing with health, that I am working all these shifts. I am not sleeping. My blood pressure's high. My lipids are going crazy. Oh, all right. Things are out of balance. And then you look at that and say, oh, where, is it, where does a change need to happen? Oh, I need to start scheduling date night. We need to protect this family time. I need to start working out in the mornings. Or 
cut back on my shifts so that my sleep can get a little bit more regular. Never going to be perfectly regular in emergency medicine, if, you know, get out of nights, but I love that dial. And you think about what's important, where do I need to put my boundaries and what is out of balance? And sometimes work will be, all right, that's just way low because I've got a family issue and that is where I'm going to be putting all my energy right now. How does that land? How does that dashboard yeah. sit with you? No, I mean, you know, hey, I like a good dashboard. Honestly, that, that <laughs> scratches my efficiency itch. You know, I like a good dashboard. <laughs> so why not one for life? That sounds right on point. But if you don't have one of these dashboards built for yourself already, and you're listening to this podcast, you realize there are people who are coaches and can help you in this decision, like yourself, Rob Orman, MD. And <laughs> they're listening going, well, how do I know when I need to reach out to someone like a coach versus just sit down with a piece of paper, like you said? What would be the impetus to say, I think you'd benefit from going to see someone to get help making this decision? Obviously, there's going to be those people who are like, I want out, like you said, and, yeah. and I need it now. But might there be a point before that where it would be beneficial to reach out and say, I'm going to get help now before I get to that point where in my mind, there's no other answer than just a total departure from the career. So you're talking about situations where there is a discordance. There's a discordance with where I am and where I want to be. And yeah. that where I want to be might not be fully articulated. It's just not here. It's just yeah. not this. It's not like this. And my kids don't know me or things just are not where I want them to be. And that's the majority of work I do with clients is helping them bridge that gap. Most people have a sense of, all right, this is not working out. And I am spending all my time at home doing my charts. I am not able to read my kids' stories. I'm not mm -hmm. able to go to this meet because I am in chart debt. And okay, that's not sustainable. Or I go to work every day with a sense of dread, nor is that sustainable. Yeah. And one of the unfortunate things about medicine is we kind of fetishize this self-sacrifice and this self-flagellation mm -hmm. that we can just take it and we just do take it for years or just continually take it until we just want to stop doing medicine. So for this kind of situation, I think it is, hey, I think I'd like to stay in medicine. I have a good income. I enjoy the medicine part of it, but I'm not really loving hmm. how it's playing out for me personally or how I, I am interacting with the system. I'm not loving it. And that can be anywhere from what you were talking about before, the red alert, that not sustainable to you know, every shift feels like a panic attack, to I'm feeling a little stuck here mm. and I'm not quite sure what to do. I, I'm going to bring something in from totally left field that you were mentioning before. And this is different from burnout or unsatisfactoriness. I work with several docs with behavioral issues. They do something that maybe was okay and acceptable when they were just hard charging as a student or resident. But once they became attending, this behavior was not going to work in, a, in, a, in an environment where people are working together for years yeah. and maybe they're at risk of getting fired or losing their license or something like that. And they don't know how to stop because these are just ingrained into the foundation of who they are and they want to stop. They don't know how to stop. And so that's another thing is here's where I am. Here's where I want to be. I don't know how to bridge that gap. And that's where coaching comes in. So it doesn't have to be a, I need an immediate out now, I'm going to reach out to a coach. And it doesn't have to be a, here's where I am and there's where I want to be and I need a coach to help me. It could just be as simple as, here's where I am. I don't know where I want to be, but I know that I don't want to still be here yeah, in, right. in a number, in two, three years or four years because I'm not happy with where I am and I don't know how to proceed still go reach out at that point because you could use a coach in all three of those circumstances. Yeah. I mean, that's what coaching does is it helps to pull out those answers, this place for you to hear yourself. And what sounds like, what, what, what? I hear myself all the time. You often don't get to. And I'd say the majority of folks come in, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where I want to go, but I know that this isn't it. Okay. Let's just, let's ask some questions and let's pull this out. And let's start turning this nebulous sense of unease into concrete, actionable steps to get out of this unease. And do you think that that alone, just the knowledge that you have identified those issues and that you've written them down and that you 
have started a process to alleviate it. Just the knowledge that you've gone that far starts to kind of give people a little bit more bounce in their step and take some of the weight off their shoulders, even just having known that, okay, I've taken the first step toward improving this scenario. Uh, absolutely. A action is the antidote for rumination. That's great. I love it. <laughs> there we go. There's it. There's the um the title for the podcast. The title for the podcast. <laughs> the podcast is the antidote episode. for rumination. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Even just writing it down. Have you ever heard of morning pages? I don't know if we talked about this. You just do that on your own. This was from the book The Artist's Way. And I'll recommend this to folks all the time. Hey, I've got this issue that I'm just kind of chewing on. All right, do the morning pages. And that is three or four pages, and you just have blank pages that you have to fill. And it's unprompted writing, and it's first thing in the morning. Ideally, before you talk to anybody, you have not interacted with your electronics, and you just write whatever is on your mind. And you don't even know. What do I write? I don't know what to write. Then write that. I don't know what to write that for three pages. <laughs> but you just start writing, and then it just flows out. And even that, when you get it from your head onto the page, it helps to start untangling all of those thoughts because it does feel like a tangle. And so, yeah, just even doing it on your own is incredibly powerful of just taking the steps to really have agency. I think that's what it's all about is having agency in your career of what am I going to do about this? And sometimes you don't know, but taking that first step, totally no. Just take a step, just start thinking about it. Start writing it down. I love it. I totally love it. That's a lot to talk about and a lot to consider in a very short amount of time. But I think for anyone listening who is in any one of those three identified gaps or, or three identified buckets that a little introspection into what it is you need and where it is you want to be seems like it would go a long way. And for me, it seems to come as a cycle every, I would say every four years, honestly, for you every two years, but maybe a little purposeful annual review of where am I compared to where I was last year? And am I meeting those goals might make it less of a major undertaking every few years if we just did it annually. Oh, beautifully articulated, Sam. Action is the antidote to rumination. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, hey, listen, I want to say thank you for being on the podcast again. Rob Orman, MD, go check him out. Put his name in the Google coaching services to keep you in your career. Tell me about the offerings from Rob Orman, MD, both in person and virtual. Yeah. We've got the podcast, Stimulus right. Podcast, which is where these ideas, we break them down. Sometimes it's me talking, sometimes it's with an expert or somebody who's got a different area of interest. So we do that. We've got the Flame Proof course, which we do twice a year. That's Scott Weingart and I do that together. And that's anti-burnout, career longevity, and self-mastery. And we made a six-month curriculum and we bring a cohort through the entire six months. And man, folks after that say, wow, I had no idea my career could feel like this. It is life-changing. And I, I say that by so self-serving, but we're in our second cohort now, and the feedback we're getting is people's careers are substantially different. So I've got one-on-one -on -one coaching, the Flame Proof course. We've got another course that is in development. It's called Out on Time, where we're going to help people get home on time. It's not released yet, but it's coming. It's going to come later towards the year, like maybe towards the end of the year. Nice. Awesome. All of that is explained at roborman.com. So you can go there, look it up, join the newsletter, listen to the Stimulus podcast, and, and continue to get that information in your email box. And really, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the life as an emergency physician because we spend all of it talking about emergency medicine, the practice. If you're listening to the podcast and you're thinking, hey, there's this deficit in where I'm putting my attention, this is a very important area to place some of that attention. And unlike most other things in life, martial arts isn't going to cure this problem. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are doing martial arts, I'm not encouraging you to quit. I'm just saying you might need a little help with some other areas, and that's okay. <laughs> it doesn't hurt, though. It I definitely mean, it might hurt a little bit physically, but mentally it's going to feel amazing. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Rob Orman, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being back on the podcast. Go check it out, everybody. RobOrman.com. 
And that's a wrap for this month's episode. I hope you found it educational and informative. Don't forget to go to ebmedicine.net to read the article and claim your CME. And of course, check out all three of the journals and the multitude of resources available to you, both for emergency medicine, pediatric emergency medicine, and evidence-based urgent care. Until next time, everyone, be safe. Be safe.